we know at this point most of the patients with myeloma are going to relapse, whether they go through a transplant or go through a non-transplant type of treatment. The speed with which patients relapse is highly variable. We know that when patients go through stem cell transplant, roughly about 20% of those patients will relapse within the first year uh, to year and a half after the uh, stem cell transplant. We know these patients have very aggressive disease and would intervene right away with uh, some kind of um, uh, treatment for the relapsed disease. Now, the patients who relapse very slowly, and this is particularly relevant in the post-transplant setting, there is probably about a third of these patients where the protein slowly starts going up over a prolonged period of time. We know that these patients actually have a better disease biology, and they generally tend to do better with all kinds of treatments that we have available. So I think it's important for us to not over-treat some of these patients. What we are seeing in this setting is similar to what we see in the small ring myeloma setting. So there are patients who are at a higher risk of progression. So the, the key thing for this group of people is to identify who are at high risk of getting some of those endogen damage in a relatively short time frame. We don't have all the answers, but I, right now what we can safely say are patients who have rapidly rising monoclonal protein uh, patients who originally present with catastrophic uh, endogen damage, whether it's neurological compromise or renal failure, those patients we generally want to treat early on after the relapse. The same thing is probably true for patients with high-risk myeloma at baseline. I think these patients also we need to intervene early rather than late. Patients who have standard risk disease, uh, who are having a very slow increase in their monoclonal protein without any other um, endogen damage, can be watched for some time before we uh, intervene in those patients because they might go for several years before they actually develop any kind of endogen damage. So if a patient progresses, uh, the patient may present uh, uh, with different symptoms. He may be completely asymptomatic. He may then present with what we call a biochemical relapse. And uh, the, the pattern of relapse usually resembles the presentation at diagnosis. So a patient who is diagnosed with active, uh, full-blown disease, many symptoms, pain in lumbar spinal, he usually relapses with aggressive disease. So that is completely different to a patient with, um, uh, who has been diagnosed with almost asymptomatic myeloma, uh, slowly progressing myeloma, uh, you achieve remission in those patients. Uh, the duration of uh, um, the treatment-free interval is much longer, and then they slowly relapse and show a biochemical relapse. And this and the treatment strategy depends uh, a little bit on how often you can um, see your patients. So in Europe, it's not a problem because you can ask the patient to come in every month or every three months, so you can watch them without any need of therapy, and then you can individualize your, your treatment decisions to his or her needs. Uh, but sooner or later, there will be the time to, um, to start treatment even in those patients, but you have to be careful uh, that you don't oversee what is called, uh, let's say, bone disease, progression of bone disease, because you may have a biochemical relapse, and, and few patients may also have bone disease, or a progression of bone disease, so you should monitor the skeleton in certain intervals in order to, uh, uh, to uh, prevent significant bone disease uh, before you start uh, therapy. There are uh, big differences between relapsing patients and primary refractory myeloma patients. Relapsing patients means that one patient has previously received one or more than one prior line of therapy, and they have achieved at least a minor response. So the M component has decreased at least 25%, and after this at least minor response, the disease is coming again. By contrast, the primary refractory is one patient that has never achieved at least a minor response to any prior line of therapy. So the situation is completely different, and the primary refractory myeloma patient is a patient at high risk. 
for this group of patients, we have to select combinations of agents completely different to try to achieve any response. The outcome for this group of patients is usually very poor. By contrast, for relapsing patients, we can consider different combinations, even retreatment with prior lines of therapy, prior drug class, to which the patient has been previously sensitive. But uh, the primary refractory myeloma patient is, uh, a, I would say, an ultra high risk subgroup of patients. And uh, fortunately, the number of patients with primary refractory disease is very reduced. And I would say that it's not superior to 3 5%. The goals of uh, therapy change uh, uh, over time because at the beginning you want to achieve the best possible remission, you want to, uh, to achieve uh, minimal residual disease negativity and uh, you want to prolong this. This may be feasible in a few patients um, um, and is feasible, but then f sooner or later patients, uh, most patients relapse and then uh, after first relapse, again, you want to achieve a very good remission, um, MRD negativity. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the third, fourth relapse, um, you want to maintain the uh, best possible quality of life. You want to, go, uh, to get your patient going. You, want, you are su satisfied with, um, uh, let's say, not complete remission, with very good uh, partial remission, partial remission. You want to control the disease, and that is important, and you want to improve his symptoms and get him going and enjoy as much as possible the days uh, which are uh, provided to him.